everybody, I'm Gary Adelman, American Battlefield Trust. Really happy to be here with Gary Gallagher again. And, uh, you know, last time we were together doing a video, uh, one of the more than 450 comments was, you two should never discuss this subject again. And we're talking about movies. What do you think? Should we do it? I think we should do it, but I'm feeling microaggressed right now, and it's going to take me a minute to get back on the rails here. That's very hurtful, that comment. Well, very, I, very hurtful. And I wish that was the only one, because people really get worked up about movies, don't they? I read some of those, too. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, and, and, and this is something where you don't have to be an expert. Did the movie move you or not? Did you enjoy it? Did you have an experience? So there was apparently some movies we left off. And it yes, is a, length, a lengthy list that you can sur surely read from there um, very well. And let's just get right into it. Let's start with some of the made-for-TV movies. Andersonville, Ironclad, and of course, The Hunley. Ted Turner was interested in the Civil War, probably still is, and he was responsible for a number of films that came out sort of in a spurt. And I think the Hunley among those, the, the tale of the Confederate submarine, is very, very well done. I think it gets a lot of things right. It gives a nice sense of the claustrophobia in the Hunley and so forth. I, I enjoyed the Hunley. Thumbs up for Armand DeSante as Captain Dixon, right? He Armand DeSante is good in almost anything, but yes, he is very good in that. The Ironclad is pretty well done, too. That's the, uh, about the Monitor in the Virginia, About right? the Monitor in the Virginia. They're both obviously made for television movies. The third of those, Andersonville, has a real, I mean, John Frankenheimer directed that, which, which kind of puts it in a notch above the others, I think, and does a very good job on the tensions among Union prisoners of war at Andersonville. Yes, I would say a lot of people have heard of Andersonville, but maybe until they saw that movie, they didn't really know that there's trials and the, theft the, the, the and whole everything. story of the raiders and the and the prisoners of war setting up their own court in essence and trying these uh, their their fellow Union soldiers who'd been preying on some of them. And no, it, it's a I think it handles that very well. Good, good. You know, one thing we didn't get last time, you know, we we, we at the end went through uh, Jim Hessler's famous now famous five cannonballs rating system. Right. Um, but what we found was in the comments people did not use the five cannonballs rating system. So starting with these first three movies, hit us with what you think about these movies. Uh, from one to five, how much did you enjoy that movie? As we, we move on to probably one of the most missed movies from our last uh, video. And we'll encourage you to go back and watch that video. Um, we'll throw the name up here on the screen so you know uh, exactly how to find it. But that was the Buster Keaton movie, The General, about the great locomotive chase. Right, I think The General is a masterpiece. I think that Buster Keaton was a comedic genius. His control over his physical actions is remarkable and they're on full display in the general, as are some of the long shots. It has, it has some of the most dramatic shots that Hollywood's ever done in some ways, including the destruction of the train in one scene. It's just unbelievable. You know, I confess that I had seen the Fess Parker, the great mo locomotive chase. And I, the Disney production. Yes. I saw that as a kid when yes. I was growing up, yes. I love that movie. I did too. I didn't feel the need to watch the general until since we have met last time, I've actually watched it, and The General is a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. Yes, the great locomotive. The, the, the Fess Parker version is enjoyable. It doesn't belong anywhere near The General as a film. The General is a masterpiece. It absolutely is on any short list of the best Civil War films. Good. So, so far also, some people really asked about, I think the most requested movie or the most chastised we were for not including a movie was probably the outlaw Josie Wales. Is this a Civil War movie? Well, you're going to pull those pistols and whistle Dixie. I love the Outlaw Josie Wales. I mean, the Civil War part of Outlaw Josie Wales, it's just the beginning. And it's the surrender or non-surrender of the guerrillas and so forth. But it's done extremely well. It's my favorite Clint Eastwood movie of any kind. Good. And, I, you know, that's one of the few Civil War movies, that and uh, Red Badge of Courage and maybe North and South that I ever saw as a kid before I got obsessed with the Civil War. So probably I, didn't think of it as a Civil War movie. Yeah, you're probably yeah. right, but I did note this this man whose family was in trouble him and running to, to get them. I, I'll never forget that moment, and that drew me in, and I enjoyed the rest of the movie. Yeah. While we're on Clint Eastwood then, and I think we're going to have to do a separate video about the good, the bad, and the ugly, so watch for that one, uh, because, <laughs> because there's, there's a lot to talk about that, and maybe we'll get you to do your own Sound or maybe or, not. Okay, well, that, that, can't blame me for trying. Um, but Clint Eastwood is in another Civil War movie as well, arguably. The Beguiled you're talking about, yes. yes. Oh my God! 
yes, it's set during the Civil War, but it could be set anywhere, any kind of soldier in any war. It's not Civil War specific in my mind, but it is set during the Civil War, and it's it's entertaining, but it's it's a little weird. Yes, it is, and so was the remake, um, roughly 2016, with yeah. Colin Farrell. Right. Um, you know, uh, I, I like romance. That th Those movies didn't exactly draw me in. No. I, I did notice among some of the comments about our original uh little video on films that some of the people thought that the battle scenes in The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly were some of the best they'd ever seen, and that I honestly don't understand. To me, they're just ridiculous in terms of what a Civil War battlefield would have looked like. Absolutely ridiculous. Right. And yet, in the last video, there are some people who, people care about different things. There's, there's one guy who talked about a movie called Wicked Spring. A friend of mine plays the, the lead in that, uh, Brian Merrick, and um, you know, he didn't like the movie much, but he said it was his favorite Civil War movie. Why? Because they got the uniforms right on. So, I mean, you're well, allowed to like that when it comes to You movies. are. That's another thing you couldn't say about the good, the bad, and the ugly. They didn't <laughs> no. get anything right. <laughs> but at we least it here. took them five hours not to get it right. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I'm not sure if we need another video now. Um, let's go on to some of the other old, older movies uh, that even older than that. And we have to talk about the elephant in the room. People really took us to task for not bringing up. Uh, I didn't have a specific list last time. We just covered as many as we could off the top of our head. We didn't do any preparation last time. No. And, and so we left off Birth of a Nation. Yes, we did. Yes. Which is one of the two most important Civil War films ever made. It and Gone with the Wind are the two most important Civil War films that have had by far the greatest impact on how Americans conceive of the American Civil War. There's just no question about it. 1915 for Birth of a Nation. It was still in release in 1948 in theaters uh, in some places. And it was technologically and cinematically a breakthrough in many ways, never mind what the story is about the Civil War. It's a movie that, that had enormous impact. Yeah, I, mean, I saw that as an adult for the first time and thought, what in the world's going on here exactly? Uh, it was a beautiful film, but I, uh, you know, it was pretty clear what they were trying to convey. Well, yeah, they convey that the heroes of the film are the Ku Klux Klan riders who, who saved the beleaguered white Southerners from the evils of Reconstruction. And so, I mean, all of the old arguments about how awful a period Reconstruction was are brought to the fore in that. As is the suffering of the Confederate South during the war, Sherman, of course, gets his nod and is this great destructive force and so forth. I mean, it's not exactly subtle, not exactly subtle, although there is a little reconciliationist theme in it because Lincoln is still a hero and everything would have been different had Lincoln lived, according to Birth of a Nation. He's the greatest friend the South has, according to Birth of a Nation. And, and I hadn't really thought about this till we're just talking right now, but you know, it seems the three movies we talked about last time, you know, you called those two, Gone with the Wind, Birth of a Nation, the most influential Civil War films right. of all time. But if you had to have a modern version of that, it would probably be Glory, Gettysburg, and Lincoln. Um, probably. At least off the yeah. top of my head. Yeah, and and what, what a different approach, how times have changed. How times uh, have changed, yep. Gone with the Wind pulls a lot of the same themes from Birth of a Nation. It deals with Reconstruction. It, deals, it's, it softens the hard sort of racist edge from Birth of a Nation. It's, it's a more paternalistic sort of edge in Gone with the Wind, but the themes are very similar in those two films, and they're, and they're indisputably the two most influential films ever made about the Civil War. And I love Gone with the Wind. Uh, you know, Gone with the Wind is a great, it's a great Gone with the Wind is, is, is a powerful film, no question about it. All right, good. So let's talk about more what people might consider sort of old films. I don't know what you want to talk about, uh, The Undefeated, Major Dundee. Well, the Undefeated and, Ma and Major Dundee, they're, they're sort of on the periphery of the Civil War. The Undefeated is Confederates headed to Mexico after the war. Uh, my favorite thing about that is that Rock Hudson, without question, has the worst Southern accent ever deployed in, in a movie, ever. I'm a Confederate officer. You can't expect me to go begging those Yankees for anything. It's just unbelievably bad. <laughs> but you get him and you get the Duke, very tall people, even get the former quarterback of the Los Angeles Rams uh, playing a Native American in this film, Roman Gabriel. You really can't make it up. Some of the things that Hollywood would do are pretty remarkable, and a lot of them are on display in the undefeated. Good, good. So uh, while we're on it then, How the West Was Won. Well, How the West Was Won, one of its five segments, uh, and one directed by John Ford, the great director, is on, is on the Battle of Shiloh, and I think yes. it's pretty well done. You have Grant and Sherman there. Sherman played by John Wayne and Grant played by Harry Morgan and they have a nice little scene and you have a, a powerful reconciliationist thing going on in the background where Russ Tamblin is a confederate and his union counterpart they find themselves off to the side and they start to talk to each other just 
guys who find themselves in a war and they really don't know why the war is even being fought and they wish they could get out of it and one of them says well why don't we go to california and then you're brought back to reality when the union soldier uh who's played by george papard is forced to kill russ tamblin because it is actually a war it's a really interesting moment there and russ tamblin will be brought back to life in the greatest uh tv series of all time of course as everybody knows twin peaks <laughs> Russ Tamlin had a long career and, and was a very acrobatic dancer, yes. <laughs> that he did. So how about Shark Island, Friendly Persuasion? We got them all. We're not going to cover Well, The everything. Prisoner of Shark Island, is, is it's a sort of Lincoln assassination film because it deals with Dr. Mudd, treats him very positively. He was unjustly imprisoned and then he behaved heroically uh, in prison when the fevers came. It's a very positive view of, of Dr. Mudd. Good, good. And I, I want to make sure that uh, I give you an opportunity because there's so many other ones people pointed out. I mean, we talked about North and South, but then the Blue and Gray. We left the blue, we, we left. We left John Boy Goes to the Civil War off. John yes, Boy. we did. I personally prefer North and South because it's more over the top and, and it's more fun other than Blue and Gray. Blue and Gray is more plodding as far as I'm concerned. It has a lot of good actors in it and, and parts of it are, are, are nicely done. But I, I personally prefer North and South. We're getting closer to the end here. Uh, what are some of the movies we've left out you'd like to talk about? Well, we've left off one of my favorites in terms of a teaching film. It's not really about the Civil War, but it takes you right up to the Civil War, and that's Santa Fe Trail, uh, which gives you a president of the United States. Ronald Reagan plays George Custer right. in it. A great treatment of John Brown in it. A good part of it is about John Brown in Kansas and then John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. It has Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis at a graduation ceremony at West Point. It has almost every union and Confederate general you can think of in the same class at West Point. It makes more mistakes per running minute than any other film I've ever seen. But it's really enjoyable. Good, good. And what else do you have? <laughs> well, we could talk about Alvarez Kelly, Richard Widmark, yes. in a film based on Wade Hampton's famous beefsteak raid, and you get a lot of kind of cowboy dimensions to that, kind of Western dimensions, as you do in Major Dundee, which has Charlton Heston as a Union officer out dealing with Confederate prisoners of war in the West. It's in that gray area between Westerns and Civil War films as well, but with major actors. Hollywood put major actors in a number of these Civil War films in the late 50s and early 60s. Yes. I've got two more things I want to bring up, but first it's just to recognize our good friend and preservationist Steve Zahn for his uh, Civil War reenactment uh, footage in Die Ever Wimpy Kid. But another movie we left out, and I've only seen recently for the first time, in part because so many people recommended it, that was Field of Lost Shoes about the Battle of uh, Newmarket, mm -hmm. not Newmarket Heights, Newmarket in May of 1864 in the Shenandoah right. Valley. Man, did I want that movie to be an hour shorter. Yeah, it was very slow. Let's put, put, put it this way. I, in fact, had never watched that. I watched it just to get ready for today. It's, it's the only preparation I did for today, and I feel like I'll never get that time back. Uh, parts of it were okay, but I don't think it did a very good job with the battle. It obviously had a limited budget to make it, so you have to take that into consideration. And yet they managed to get bloody Bannister Tarleton Jason Isaac um, into the movie, and yeah. man, he's John C. Breckenridge, and he is wearing this exact hat. So that made yep. me happy. Yep. I enjoyed that I part of the movie. I thought he did a pretty good job with Breckenridge. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I actually, there's a lot about the movie that I enjoyed. They developed the characters well. They got in somebody from the now popular TV show Cobra Kai to be a disappointed girlfriend when her uh, soon-to-be betrothed uh, actually dies. So I enjoyed the movie overall. I just thought that it was it was overdeveloped. It, it could have been a lot shorter. Yeah, I think it could have been a little bit shorter. And at Cobra Kai, you, you make a lot of references to things that I have no idea uh, are even happening in our well, world. I have little kids and it's uh, it's 2020, so I watch a lot of younger people stuff. So, But here we are, coming to the end of our segment, and you know what we have to do. We have to honor Jim Hessler and his cannonball rating. So in no particular order, I'm going to try to spit these out, and you tell me how many cannonballs halves are allowed. We're going to start with the Field of Lost Shoes. Two. The General. Five. Andersonville. Three. How the West was won. That one scene in How the West was won, I'd say three and a half. The Clint Eastwood Beguiled. Two. Uh, Outlaw Josie Wales. Five. Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Two and a half. Major Dundee. Two and a half. Santa Fe Trail. Four. Birth of a Nation, the original one. Five as a film, as an important film, and one in terms of its attitudes and postures. All right. Shark Island. Two. Alvarez Kelly. Two and a half. The Undefeated. I would give The Undefeated a two. I'd give it a five in terms of having a, of an accent so bad that you cannot ever get it out of your mind. All right, good. Ironclad. Two and a half. Hunley, three and a half. 
And lastly, I believe, blue and gray. I think blue and gray is a solid three and a half. And there you have it, Gary Gallagher's own uh, ratings of all these movies. We appreciate you watching. We appreciate your feedback. Hit us with your cannonball ratings. You don't have to be nice to us, but hit us with productive comments so we know what videos you want to see in the future. Thanks so much, Gary. Thanks to Andy behind the camera. And thank you all for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education.